And lesson number one is one of the toughest ones. Imagine uh, somebody doing this exercise, and one of the people they see is their daughter. And to say this person doesn't mean anything? Yes, yes. I love the instructions to the workbook because he's saying, you know, some of these ideas, you know, you may not believe. Uh, some of them you may actively resist. This does not matter. Oh, I love those kind of instructions. I mean, he's telling me right away, he's like, you may, you may fight against this, react against this, you may actively resist the application of these ideas. Like, like what you're saying is, that's quite common. People will start off with lesson one, and they start looking around the room, the room they're doing it, and they've got, they got their daughter's picture on the, on the table, the end table right next to them. Uh, Kent Wabnick told a story one time where he said uh, he was working with a group of nuns and um, you know he spent I think the weekend or several days with them and, and they were practicing the course there, they were doing the first lessons <coughs> of the course and everything, nothing I see means anything, so they're going around the, they're going around the, the sanctuary. This stained glass window does not mean anything. This pew does not mean anything, you know. They go all the way around. This is Catholic nuns. They go around the whole thing and then they come to the Eucharist. Mm. They go, oh, we'll skip that, of course. <laughs> you know, because, because, you know, the whole, their whole career as nuns <laughs> is based in the Eucharist. The body of Christ, you know, when they give, you know, communion, the body of Christ, we drink this you know, wine is the blood, you know, they, and, and the Eucharist, you know, they skipped right over that. And that's, no, that's what people will do if they're identified as a parent. And that child is a very important part of their life and their whole identity. Or even a newlywed couple. A newlywed couple. Imagine that. You're on the wedding night and <laughs> you haven't even got your clothes off yet to consummate the marriage. You probably saw the movie Time Traveler's Wife. Did you ever see that yeah. one? Where they're actually on the wedding night and he, he disappears just in the, in the wedding bed. <laughs> just his clothes are left. He, he's gone. And it's like, the ego's like, oh, not good. Or on, in that movie, he's, they're going to go down the altar and, and the groom disappears uh, right before the service. He, he's a time traveler. He, he go. That, those are the kind of things that the ego finds extremely challenging because, because the identity is so much into the personality. And there's so many aspects, like it could be a partner, it could be a child, you know, it could be a house, it could be a prized possession, that you, something, uh, you know, a keepsake that you've had for 20, 30, 40 years. The, when you start to take that lesson and let your eyes move around the room and give equal amount of attention to each thing that your eyes rest on and so on and so forth, that's the very beginning of the undoing and the dismantling of, of, this, of this false self-concept. And I had a friend of mine who had been in the convent for years and you know all kinds of things. She started working with the Course and we were down in the woods of Kentucky just meditating and kind of going inward and, and we started doing the lessons of the Course and she opened it up and she started doing lesson number one. And she just came to me and she said, you know, that, that's insulting. Jesus is insulting me. That's, that's an insulting lesson. Nothing I see means anything. But I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to do some of these early lessons. And she did lesson two. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. She's three, four, five. You know, after the first ten, twelve lessons, she said, that's insulting. That's, just tell me that it's going to get better uh, than this. Tell me these are just the preliminaries. You know, can I jump ahead? I know the instructions you can't do more than. She said, these, these lessons are just, they're insulting. And I said, I said, listen, the way that's designed is if you can get any single lesson completely and entirely by completely transferring the training without making any exceptions, You've got the whole book. You've, you've done the whole thing. You don't have to do another lesson. You can, you're finished. If you, if you get it at number one, you don't have to do the other 364. If you get it at 50, you know, the, the other, what, 315. You're, because 
it's different. It's not cumulative learning like we're used to, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, you know, division, algebra, calculus. You don't go to calculus. Calculus doesn't mean anything unless you've got all the previous skills. Not so with training your mind with this perception. If you can transfer the training completely without making any, any exceptions, you're back into the quantum moment. You're back into the forgiven world. You're back into the, the happy dream. Just from your willingness to not make exceptions. So how would you explain to a parent if their children are running around when they're doing the exercise? How do you explain to them when they do that exercise? My child doesn't mean anything? Well, the way it works is, people see that I'm happy and joyful. So they think, I don't know what's going on with that guy, but there's something good. I don't know, he's happy, he's friendly, he's kind, he's, he's, I'd like to be around the guy. So then, for example, I got invited to Sweden, rural Sweden, by a group of parents. They're of course in miracle students, but they're dealing with their children every day. Concerns, worries, stress, all, all the, the whole thing, the whole package. So they invite me to go over there to this farm in rural Sweden, and we sit down together, not only the parents, but the kids too. And we all come together and we say, okay, now let's go into this together. Moment by moment, step by step. And, and I've done, that same scene has happened over the years. I remember I was, I had a hermitage in Kentucky, and some of my students back in the 1990s, they, they had partners, they had children, and two, of the people that I was working with very closely, they each brought their sets of children down into the woods to this little place by a lake down there. And they said, can you help us? We're going through a lot of struggles with our children. And so they said, we really want to go in. So we, we went off with uh, chairs, like uh, lawn chairs, into the woods to sit around in a circle to go deeply into meditation, and deeply into these kind of open discussions. Meanwhile, the kids, they, would, they were chasing dogs and playing in the woods and they were having a ball. They were just laughing, playing, as the parents were asking me all these deep questions. We were going deeper and deeper into the mind. The kids were just running, playing, chasing the dog. And then the kids would occasionally show up and I would say to the kids, tell me about God. And then they would start channeling the Holy Spirit. The parents would be like, just kids and they've got all this wisdom, you know. They would start talking about God. The kids, some of them were little kids, they would just talk, channel the Holy Spirit. Then they'd go off playing again. They weren't going to sit around talking about these ideas. It was too much fun playing in the woods, chasing the dog and talking. So then uh, we would be there and, the, and the, the kids, now these are Course in Miracles kids. They've been listening to their parents practicing the Course for years. So they've heard all this stuff, you know, they've been listening to this, nothing I see means anything stuff, and they're just playing and listening and everything. So I get the parents there, we're all together, the kids come around there and everything, and then the kids are like, they come up and they say, you know, my parents are not fun. They just study this stupid blue book all the time, and they're meditating, and they're just useless. They're no fun, they don't play, and this and that, they're like metaphysical, and just, can you help us? with these parents. <laughs> That's the problem. They're no fun. How can there be a course on love and have such boring parents? So I said, okay, we'll work with this. So I work with the whole group of them and the kids are like, okay, let's go swimming. So all the kids want to go swimming. And the parents go, no. You, you know, we're at a lake, there's no lifeguard. You know, we're not just going to let you go out there and go swimming with no supervision, no lifeguard, you know, you're young children. And this is important, you know, and they're like, this is boring. <laughs> we are going swimming. So then the kids said, the parents said, no, you're not going swimming. And the kids said, what's wrong? Are you afraid? Are you afraid something will happen to our bodies? <laughs> <laughs> You keep telling me we are bodies, Mom. Uh, are you afraid something's going to happen to our bodies? And the parents are like, yeah, yeah, that's why I'm here. I'm here, so you can't go swimming. Uh, 
you know, the kids, do you think we're going to die? Do you believe we can die? We're not spirits? You know, oh boy, did the kids, you know, you know, practical application, you know. And the parents were like, oh. So the parents were like, looking at me like, this is scary. This is getting real scary here. What do we do? And I said, let's move our discussion down to the lake. So we can be down there by the lake having our discussion with your kids in view. They liked that. They thought that's a good idea. Then we got down there and the kids were like, the parents were like, okay, we're going to talk with David. It's very important. We're glad we can be down here, but all of you put your life jackets on. Because <laughs> we're going to talk with David and we don't want to. Same thing. Why do we need to wear life jackets? <laughs> Are you afraid we'll drown? Do you think we're bodies? You know, it just the same thing started coming, coming again. And I've worked with with parents and children over the years, and the same kind of themes would come up. Like, um, one time the, the children really were saying, at the spiritual community I was in, they were saying the parents were so boring. They meditate all the time, and they talk metaphysical discussions, they're no fun. So finally, the kids just said, meet with us. Please, David, meet with us. What do we do with these, these parents? I said, well, I said, you can really get the parents' attention if you train your minds, because that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to train their minds. And if you work with me and you train your minds, that will definitely get their attention. They will not ignore you. If you can show them that you're transcending time and space, like the Buddha or Jesus, oh, oh boy, that's gonna, they'll be very interested. They'll come and sit with you right away. So, so they said, how do we do this? And we want this to be fun. I said, well, okay, what we're going to do is, we're going to practice that everything that you experience in your mind is a decision of your mind. Nothing in the world makes you feel any way. Nothing makes you do anything. It's all just in your own mind. It's in your own consciousness. And the kids were like, very excited about that. Like, oh yeah, teach us this. We can use this with our parents. So, I said, the parents believe they can make you laugh. But we're going to practice over here really working with the idea that, that only you make you laugh. Nobody outside of you can make you laugh. And so, and then we're going to invite your parents to come in and try to make you laugh. <laughs> and I, I said, but this is going to be pretty easy for you and you're just going to be able to be there like the Buddha. They're, they're not going to make you laugh at all. You're just going to look at them kind of like a Morpheus, kind of with Neo. It's going to be, I said, that's going to be the easy part. But then, the parents are going to come at you, uh, and, and, and they're going to try to do, make you laugh by tickling you. They're going to physically come on, on you, and under the arms, they're going to come at you. And you need to be able to be in a state of mind where you can go, like, you know, Morpheus. <laughs> like, bring it on. Because that's the time they're going to say, oh, we can make you laugh. Don't think you, you can, you're so mind trained. And they're going to come at you and they're going to tickle you. But you're not ticklish unless you decide to be ticklish. And your mind is so powerful that you can train your mind to, you don't giggle, you don't laugh, you don't even feel ticklish unless you want to feel ticklish. You decide you're not going to be ticklish and you are not ticklish. This is going to be more advanced mind training. And those kids work with me and practice with each other. <laughs> they, like little ninjas, they let the... They come at each other and they try to and practice with each other to the point that their mind was so clear and firm that first they let the parents come in and they said, try to make us laugh. And the parents made faces and told jokes and did all the things and the kids were mm -hmm. totally unmoved. Almost like, is that the best you can do? <laughs> and the parents then did just what I said they'd do. They would say, we're going to make you laugh and then they charged the children and they tried to tickle the children, and the children were just, is that it? Uh, yeah. Is that the best? Is that the best you can do? You know, they were, mm -hmm. well that definitely got the parents' attention. Like, what have you been doing? Because, because everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants peace of mind. Everybody wants to have a trained mind. You know what Jesus says in the Course, an untrained mind can accomplish nothing. Everybody wants that. 
And we can be inspired by the Holy Spirit to let it be fun, to let our mind training be enjoyable. That's why we have books like the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment. Most people on the planet enjoy movies. Why not use it for your mind training? You know, people enjoy a lot of things. The Holy Spirit can work with you with what you believe. Music. The Holy Spirit can use music in a big way. And we can actually find that we can train our minds in enjoyable ways. And then trust the Holy Spirit will loosen our mind from these attachments that we have. So that at some point in our life, if, if a child or a parent seems to die, or to become, there's a divorce, and, and the, the, or the child is, is taken away for some, whatever the reasons or circumstances, that when that feeling of loss comes up, that deep sense of hurt and woundedness and loss, we can actually work with the Holy Spirit and help loosening our mind from the belief in loss. And there's one part of the Course in Miracles where Jesus says, you have, you have many crazy ideas, but perhaps the craziest of all your ideas is the belief that you can lose the ones that you love. We have to come to a state of mind training where we see that it's not what's happening on the screen, you know, people leaving and people dying, that's really upsetting for us. So we're not really grieving what seems to be their disappearance, or their passing, but what we're doing is we have this belief in loss that's in our unconscious mind, that we've never actually allowed that to come into awareness. But we can, we all can do that. And when we do it together, we, we save time. We find ways to pray together, to join together, to open up to new tools, new mechanisms, new things that are, that are enjoyable, that are, that are actually fun that help us speed up this, this undoing of the ego. So it's great, you're raising great, great questions because it actually, it can seem impractical for somebody who has no spiritual training whatsoever and no kind of conscious belief in God or a higher power. And yet if they really have a willingness to, to take on something like the Course, they can zoom and advance in their mind training in an amazing way. I remember my friend uh, Francis, we went to China a few different times and um, her mother was like, you know, always just wondering, what, what's happening to you? Your life is changing so much and I hardly recognize you as my own daughter. And, and at one point she just uh, heard from Francis, she said, well David's teachings are in Mandarin online. Why, she told her mother, why don't you just go and read all of David's teachings online in Mandarin. So her mother did, she was very curious, like what's happening to my daughter? So she started reading and she read deeper and deeper and deeper and she started getting into the parts that was saying that even interpersonal relationships like mother-daughter relationships are part of an illusion that have no validity and no reality. Well, she reads this and she's just like, oh my God. I can't believe that. So she, she met with Francis and she said uh, to Francis, I read, I read what David wrote online and I, I, mean, I, I just don't get it. If, if I'm not your mother and you're not my daughter, then what is our relationship? Who are we and what, what, what is our relationship? And Francis paused a moment and prayed because her mother is an atheist, her mother has no spiritual training and no inclination towards spirituality whatsoever. And she's being asked the question, what is our relationship if it's not that? And so Francis just prayed and what came out of her mouth was, uh, our relationship is the dreamer of the dream to the dream figure. And her mother said, what? what? dreamer of the dream to the dream figure. And she said, well, you know when you go to sleep at night and you dream these dreams, everything seems so real in the dream. You really think you're there. Your emotions are there, everything's happening. But then when you wake up, you just know it was just a figment of the imagination, it was just a dream. She said, that is really what's happening with this world. That this world as well is a dream. 
and we've forgotten that we're dreaming, and we're just playing the characters, and we're so identified with the roles and the characters, mm -hmm. that we forgot that we're dreaming, and we get all wrapped up in all these dramas and emotions mm -hmm. and everything, and these roles. We get lost in the roles. Mm -hmm. We forget our spiritual identity. And her mother went, oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> That's just, t no spiritual training whatsoever, just the power of love bringing them together for that sincere question, a sincere open heart, with no spiritual training at all. She goes, that is just totally amazing. She says, I, I get it. I actually get it. So then her mother turns to her and she says, so really then, the only real question is, who am I? And Francis said, yes, that's it. So then we fly, we leave China, and her mother starts to have these mystical experiences. <laughs> After just reading these ideas, with no spiritual training whatsoever, and having that encounter with her daughter, she starts having mystical experiences, and she starts writing and, and calling Francis, going, oh my God, my mind is just opening up so fast, and I can't even explain what's happening to my friends. My friends are thinking, now I, they're thinking the same thing about me that I was thinking about you. <laughs> like, what is happening to this lady? She said, but they're so glorious. I feel so expansive. I feel so connected. I feel so in love with everyone in these experiences. But it's frustrating because I can't explain them to my friends. And Francis said, don't try. It's just all for you. It's just all happening for you. And that showed me, it was just a great example. It doesn't have to do about time, and it doesn't have to do with prior training in spirituality. And it doesn't even really have to do with belief in God. Uh, there's a part one time where Jesus says, it's an amazing line, where Jesus says, belief in God is unnecessary. For God can be but known. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, from Jesus Christ? You know, where the Christians are so concerned about who's a believer, right. who's a believer and who's not a believer, yeah. who's saved and who's not saved. And Jesus himself says, belief in God is unnecessary. So to me, I could see that, oh my gosh, this whole world is false beliefs. And if someone calls himself an atheist, or a scientist, or a believer, or an unbeliever, or whatever, it doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. because we're just undoing all the beliefs that, about everyone. And we don't have to believe, we don't have to think like that anymore. We can actually be so open-minded. And I love about traveling around the world, because somebody will come to me and they'll say, I'm an atheist, and we just have the most wonderful time, and we don't even have to go to that issue of belief or, or unbelief. We just share the joy, we just share the love. And, and the Spirit uses whatever words, I mean, I'd be scientists. If I'm talking to a scientist, I just zoom right into quantum physics. And they love it, they light up. And if I'm with somebody who's identified as a Christian, Oh, it's so biblical. I've never seen myself talk so biblical. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, praise God. <laughs> and then I'm over with a Buddhist. <laughs> and it comes out in the, in the Buddhist way. And they go, yeah, you know, we're meant to connect and join and rejoice with everybody, not to try to split hairs mm -hmm. over illusory beliefs, really. You know, in the end, who cares if they, if they believe in God or they don't, you know? I. I just rejoice in love. I don't really care what they believe in. So you can see where this is all leading. It's leading to a sense of true non-judgment and true complete open-mindedness. So that, that we can be totally, truly helpful and connect with everyone and feel connected without any barriers. One time I, I just show one more example. I went to an Indian reservation out here in California and I went to the Indian Reservation and it was a teenager and his mother and father. The father was totally into the Native American traditions. The mother had been raised Catholic and she was totally into Jesus. No interest at all in the Native American traditions. And then their teenage son, 
who was about 16, who there was a big disconnect with the parents and the teenager. I could feel it when I walked on there. So I go walking with the father, and the Holy Spirit poured through me completely in Native American language. Um, I was even talking about Pocahontas, I mean anything that I, it was just all about no boundaries, everything's con connected, everything's the spirit, everything's shared. Then I go walking with the mother, and I do it all through Christian terms. And she's just so happy, it's just like this love of Jesus was so strong, it was such a connection with her. Then I go off with the teenage son, and he's not interested in Native American or Jesus at all. He's into the Matrix. <laughs> and uh, we shared such a deep walk and connection, because it was all spoken in Matrix terms. Neo, Morpheus, Trinity, you know, the Sentinels, you know, the whole thing. Then we all come back together, and, and all three of them are like, Wow, we had such a fun day with David. <laughs> the father looks at the mother and says, Do you have a fun day with you? Hmm, that's surprising. <laughs> and she said, I had a wonderful time with David and everything. And then they look at the son and they say, What about you? And he said, I had the best time with David. They said, You? <laughs> you don't even have a spiritual bone in your body. I don't see how you could have. <laughs> the Matrix. Like, what? A crazy movie? You know, it was like everybody's got their own perceptions and they relate to the source in their own way. Yes. And they have deep experiences, but the semantics are completely different. And the Holy Spirit is not bothered at all by the semantics or the seeming beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's why we train our mind with the Holy Spirit, so we can be fully present completely with whoever we seem to be with, because it's really our self, and all we really desire is love and connection. And the Spirit knows the way. The Spirit will inspire us and show us. It could be through music, it could be through anything. Uh, one looks at this at this exercise like lesson one. If I find myself feeling uncomfortable when I really am doing my part to uh, embrace the lesson, and I find that there's a part of me that literally doesn't feel, these, these hands don't mean anything. Yeah, I think that's what I like about the lessons is they're, they're designed by the Master, so you can trust that when you give yourselves over to them, you're just going to try to follow the two instructions. You know, don't do more than one lesson a day, and as best you can, try not to make exceptions. <clears throat> but you're not expected to be a spiritual master. You're not expected to be enlightened when you're doing these lessons. In fact, if, if the mind was enlightened, it wouldn't need these lessons. So you could come at it with, with humbleness and sincerity and say, hmm, I think I might have some resistance to these lessons. And I know that that's going to come up. And I know the one who designed these lessons knows that that's going to come up. And I can be really gentle with myself. I can, I can continue to move through the lessons, not try to get into perfectionism, or judging myself, or concluding, I, I'm not going to be able to do these lessons, it's too hard, or this and that. But just to continue to progress through them. And intuitively, even if you feel Guide to stay with a particular lesson, like there's something there for you, follow that intuition. Maybe stay with it for one, two, three, four days, if you really find one that's very impactful, and you want to go with it. And trust the process, you know, trust yourself in that process, and know that even if you have resistance, or active resistance, that he says, just doing them will show you that they're true. You need not believe them. Some of them you may actively resist. This does not matter. Those are comforting words to hang in there with it. And, and in that sense too, to stay open in terms of support. Maybe, maybe it helps to do them with, with a partner or a group of people. Maybe there's things online that, that can come to you, that come into your inbox that support you. 
maybe there's certain types of music or meditation that, that you can incorporate. You know, just know that the help will be given you and you don't have to feel overwhelmed. You, you're not doing it wrong at all. <laughs>